<laughs> okay, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to tonight's MCC Brussels event. Uh, Lights out is the EU failing energy security uh, sorry, energy policy. Um, my name is Tony Gilland. I'm the head of outreach and partnerships at MCC Brussels, and I'm very uh, pleased to see you all here. Um, MCC Brussels exists, if you haven't been to one of our events before, uh, to open up debate. We want ideas to be heard without being shouted down for not conforming to the consensus. So tonight is no exception. We have the issue of energy on the table. When I was at university, or shortly afterwards, my first job was in the energy industry. And I have to say, it completely killed any conversation at a party. Because in the early 90s, nobody was interested in energy particularly. It was seen as necessary but dull. <laughs> Today, it's anything but dull. It's never out of the headlines. People are talking about it. People are anxious about it. People know we have some really significant and fundamental issues to deal with. And that's what we're going to do uh, tonight. So I'm really pleased to have uh, giving our paper on energy with the same title, Lights Out, Is the EU Failing on Energy Policy? We have Professor James Woodhausen. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about James uh, before I introduce our two respondents, who I'm equally delighted can join us. Uh, and then it will be over to them. So James is a vi visiting professor uh, of forecasting and innovation at London South Bank University. He has a very long biography, and I'm not going to read it all out. But to give you a few highlights, uh, he was uh, the editor of Design Magazine, so he's given us a really hard time about the design of the publication that we just produced, because he's been giving us the, input, uh, you know, the benefit of his advice. He was the director of forecasting for the Henley Centre, <coughs> And the, he was the editor of Big Potatoes, uh, the London Manifesto for Innovation. So design, technology, and innovation is his gig. And that's what you're about to find out about. <laughs> OK, responding first, delighted to have uh, Mr. Rob Roos, uh, sorry, Roos, uh, if that's roughly uh, uh, correct, uh, MEP. He's uh, a member of parliament for, uh, uh, for, for the Netherlands. He's vice chairman of the European Conservatives and reformist group, uh, and he's the head of the delegation for the JA21 uh, uh, party. He was uh, originally an engineer and an entrepreneur, and was elected to the European Parliament in 2019. Particularly relevant uh, tonight, he sits on the Industry, Industry Research and Energy Committee, and he's got a specialist interest in energy policy. But also, and it's well worth following uh, Rob on Twitter, he puts out a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, he's got a very strong interest in COVID-19 policy and the impact that that had and the way in which that debate was conducted. And he's a big uh, fan and advocate of the importance of free speech. Um, very pleased to have uh, Rob here. And he will also be telling you about a report, Road to U EU Climate Neutrality by 2050, uh, which is a report that he instigated uh, and has some very interesting results in it. Then, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Peter Heffler. If I do that some justice or uh, somewhere near correct, please correct me if you prefer. No, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it there for now. <laughs> uh, so Peter is a policy director, or is the policy director at the Wilfried uh, Martin Center for European Studies. Uh, he has a PhD in economics and economic history. Uh, he has previously worked uh, in very senior posts at the Konrad Adenauer Institute, uh, first in Berlin, uh, then as the director of its China office, uh, and also as the re uh, director of the regional project uh, Energy Security and Climate Change, based in Hong Kong. Uh, so very, very well equipped to talk to us tonight. And I was really pleased to see uh, this report that he's uh, been involved in putting together that's just come out. It's called, it's, sorry it's not in colour, but it's quite grey in the original. Uh, it, but the, the content isn't grey. It's called The Seven Ds uh, for Sustainability. And it's the, the, the uh, Wilfrid Martin Centre, I think together with the EPP, uh, uh, to some extent, no? Okay. So it's our proposal, and it's your the party will follow to some extent. 
So it's, it's the, the Centre's proposal, and you will wait and see the extent to which the EPP group uh, uh, follow the proposals. But within that, you're raising lots and lots of difficult questions about the future, one of which is decarbonisation. Um, so we shall find out more from Peter. OK, thank you very much. Uh, James, the floor is yours. Your notes are exactly where you left them. If you could please welcome James. You're all going to regret doing that very <laughs> soon. So, um, and I, you'll forgive me being a little bit professorial here with three pairs of glasses. Um, but don't worry about it. It's downhill all the way from now. Um, can I just ask my friend at the back here, can we open that door there? There's going to be a lot of hot air coming from me. Uh, the uh, European Union will ban air conditioners very soon. So uh, maybe we can even have a window open if you're feeling creative uh, there and the voice, the sound isn't too bad. Now, uh, I ought to tell you, I may move around for our live streaming audience, if that's all right with you, uh, Mr. Cameraman. But... Um, I was on the Eurostar here as because, of course, one must not fly uh, to Brussels. And they told me the, on the, in the loo that the taps would be slow. And then they told me that the Wi-Fi would be slow. And <laughs> I'm here to tell you that the European Union is slow to catch up with events in energy. Why is that? We'll come to that. Uh, I believe that you could say it's in cryogenic hibernation in many ways about the key question for the medium term and the longer term, which is energy production and distribution, not saving energy, energy efficiency, and the dubious claims that renewables have to reliable production of energy. So, of course, when you go to the European Ursula von der Leyen, you'll find recently that she said that the EU has made tremendous progress in this area. What did she mean by tremendous progress? She meant there's been tremendous progress in legislation coming out of Brussels. And the progress is so much in legislation and regulation that uh, in the pamphlet that I hope you will get, uh, the head of a European Employers Association said, it's like a tsunami, uh, to quote the Japanese, of legislation and regulation, which is going to do manufacturing in Europe no good in terms of international competitiveness. It's interesting for me at least, I'm sure for you, that von der Leyen believes that progress is a matter of legislation. That's what she has called progress, not progress in production and distribution of energy. And what the progress consists of is, I thought I had it on me, but I don't have it, my hotel room telling me, a bit of time since I've been in a hotel, that I shouldn't use the towels like I usually do. And uh, it means turning down the thermostat, uh, if you can, to save energy. And in France, until next year, in fact, because of the lack of energy after the invasion of Ukraine, uh, France has a campaign for uh, la sobriété de l'énergie. As we know, the French are very good at sobriété. Uh, well, that, you missed that joke. Uh, <laughs> but um, thank you. Ah, hold the hands, you see. The, the youth, so many young people... You know, if you added up all your ages, you'd get to my age. Um, so watch out for the jokes, all right? And if they're too fast in English, you must let me know. Um, so everywhere you go, from the side of the Belle Mall to my hotel room to advertising campaigns, it's all about sustainability. Does anybody here know who first coined the phrase, which public figure, widely hated, first coined the phrase, Sustainability. Does ever anybody know? Come on, have a go. It was about trees. Trees? Forest. Forest. And who was it? I don't know. 
Okay, well, that wasn't the question, but it's a, very good answer. it's a very good answer. Now, before you take any more pictures, madam, you've got to talk to my agent, all right? But um, uh, who was it? Anybody know? The man at the back will know. The man at the back will know. Well, it was, in fact, Margaret Thatcher in 1988, the frothiest year of the Thatcher decade. And she was a chemist. She was addressing the Royal Society. And you don't have to be a little bit radical and uh, strange like me to wonder, well, wait a minute, Margaret Thatcher pioneered sustainability? That's a bit interesting. Everywhere you go, many years later, there are all these demands for you to change your behavior. And the latest thing in America is uh, President Biden is going after dishwashers. Now, it's true, in America, dishwashers are about that big, all right? And they use a lot of energy. But one must again wonder, where are they going to strike next? Will it be air conditioning? Will it be packaging? Well, in fact, they're doing all of these things on packaging and so on. And if you read the new legislation, if you can keep up with it, which I try to do, they are dealing with methane, phosphorus cycles, nitrogen cycles, Dutch cows, existing buildings, not just uh, new ones, cars using the internal combustion engine, packaging waste, microplastics, the soil, and the seabed. And I'm wondering whether my deodorant is green enough uh, as well. So everywhere you go, you have this policy objective of lowering emissions, carbon emissions and general greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, they've also just woken up too slowly, like the taps on Eurostar and the um, Wi-Fi on Eurostar. They've woken up to the fact that critical raw materials, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are a problem for the EU as it moves towards, or tries to move towards, let's discuss it, electric vehicles. Now I can see nobody's taking any notes at the moment, which is great, because uh, then I can't be uh, misrepresented. But I want to say that if you carefully look at the speech by Valdis Dombrovskis um, in March, a top man at the EU, after all the talk of uh, European values in the face of the uh, invasion of Ukraine, they are faced with something now, and he, he mentioned it, that their line on critical raw materials, the materials that go into the batteries, for example, in electric cars, and that go into the wind turbines that the EU is so keen on. By the way, I like electric cars. I quite like wind turbines. I even believe in climate change and that we had a role in that. So we can come on to all of these things. But what did Mr. Dombrovsky say? He said, we are moving from naivety on critical raw materials. In other words, just let's have lots of electric cars and not worry about the provenance of the materials in their batteries. We're going to move from that, from naivety to action. If you read the white paper, here it is, you will find an end note that uh, discusses cobalt. Cobalt is an important ingredient in batteries, in Teslas and all of these things. For how long and where has cobalt been mined? Does anybody know? Congo. The Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's enormously democratic down there. <coughs> and uh, w w w what, who has been mining it there? Children. Yeah, and which multinationals have been mining it there Chinese and when did they come in in the mid 2000s if you follow through the reference if you search for cobalt you'll find the Chinese have enjoyed a 20% compound annual growth rate CAGR for our economic historians since around 2005 nearly 20 years later the EU is finally waking up to the fact that 40,000 children are mining cobalt in the Democratic Republic of the Congo 
for Chinese employers with their bare hands. That is what I mean about being behind the curve of not having a plan B ready for when you need more cobalt from somewhere else. And so I want to say that, you know, it's from naivety to action just about 15, 20 years too late on that. Why are they so behind the times? Because energy policy is subordinated to climate policy. It's what we call a category error. And therefore their focus is on legal tactics, not production, strategy, and also I should add research and development on energy, R&D. How much do they spend on R&D? Not the EU, it doesn't spend very much on R&D at all, and certainly not on energy. But how much do EU member states, all 27 of them without Britain, uh, spend on energy research each year? Would anybody care to guess? Come on, I'm going to come closer if you're not careful. <laughs> um, it's, it's about a billion euros. Sounds like a lot. Over 27 nation states? to assure, assure the future, that is very, very little compared with America, compared with China, the leader in all green technologies. Stop using the word green. Just say Chinese. Right? That, that is what it is. You might not like it. I don't like it. But it's China and secondly America that is leading research and development in all of that. The money is nothing in the EU for uh, new R&D. It's even smaller for fossil fuels R&D. And the focus is actually, interestingly enough, the numbers are all in the pamphlet, the focus is much more on energy efficiency, another way of saving energy, than it is even on renewables. So they're not very interested in that long-term future, which is what you should be if you like innovation. And it brings me to an important second point. The first is that they subordinate, I'm afraid, energy policy to climate policy, and the second is they don't seem to understand the difference between not just legislation and production, but also tactics and strategy. Would anybody care to tell me the difference between tactics and strategy? Yes, I oh, no, just stroking your, stroking your lips, right, okay, anybody else? Strategy is long term and tactics are just... Oh, I gave the game away. Yeah, that's right. But should know that. Well, in fact, if you go back to the Romans and also Clausewitz, who we can always have a discussion on, especially with um, Dr. Heffeler, um, the real difference, you're nearly there, is tactics is winning a battle. Strategy is winning the war. Right? They're not even really winning the battle. And if we don't get a mild winter this winter, if we get a really cold winter, we'll find out that you can pass legislation, but if you burn that in your house, it's not going to keep you warm. What we need is more strategy, more for the long term, to win the war on energy production. Now, I just want to uh, begin to start to commence to get ready to rock and roll to uh, conclude. They've been very fixated on all of this climate policy for a long, long time. But just because of the wonderful nature of Tony and the MCC and Kinga and everybody else in that organization, they specially timed this speech to coincide with a fortnight, really, or 10 days, when all the establishment parties, with the exception of heretics and renegades like our friends here, are starting to have nerves, doubts, reservations, such as you may have harboured yourselves, gentlemen, about this single-minded focus on net zero. We heard it with the head of European manufacturers and his worries about European competitiveness. But now what we've got is um, Monsieur Macron uh, in what um, one economist at Deutsche Bank and described as a major blow, was it something I said? Oh, no, no, okay. Um, the, a major blow for energy, uh, for the net zero, for the, sorry, for the Green Deal uh, in Europe, the 
Macron has said, uh, I'm not going to do what you want me to do because you won't accept that I can make hydrogen from nuclear power. He loves nuclear power, does Emmanuel, and Ursula and our German friends don't like nuclear power. So he's already obstructing the progress to hydrogen, which they believe to be an important ingredient of net zero. They're quite wrong. We can discuss hydrogen. But he's worried about net zero messing up his plans for the French nuclear industry. And that is a big blow, his obstruction according to our Deutsche Bank economist friend. He believes that nuclear is strategic for net zero. Not, not for supplying us with electricity, but for net zero. Ursula von der Leyen and many Germans believe it isn't strategic. They've said as much. Uh, literally, it's not strategic. They want renewables. That's it. And that's a great pity, uh, because renewables, in my book, are unreliables. You can say that they took 40% of British energy electricity production last year. It's, it's fine, but when the wind doesn't blow and when the sun doesn't shine, they take 0%. And the thing about energy is like we need it all the time. European civilization is based on energy to a large degree. Now, it's not only that they're late and prefer tactical legislation to strategic planning for energy supply, but because of these natural differences in endowments of natural resources, of nuclear power, and so on, the energy issue is fragmenting the EU a great deal. Germany built so much gas storage after the invasion of Ukraine that it upset the EU Commission. France has too little gas storage right now. Why is that? They've got strikes in France. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I mean, you know, who, who'd, who'd have thought it? You know, they, they, I mean, it's a whole industry in France, right? You know, in Britain, we pass a resolution. In France, they take a battering ram to the local police station. That's historically obvious, right? But still, they are now low on gas, right? And it's a problem for them. So there are all these differences, and of course, not only is the thinking weak uh, and with these category errors and the fragmentation growing, and it will certainly grow in the winter to come, right after the Russian invasion, uh, Schultz went to Africa, Duda, the president of Poland, went to Africa, Italy went to Algeria and Azerbaijan, the European the European Commission had zero influence over the gas supplies wanted by nations that were severely affected. The European Union is not thinking about that and believes that gas is only a transition fuel uh, and then wonders why nobody will invest in gas in Europe. So there are these differences and they go to the petrol or the diesel that they used was artificial synthetic fuel net zero fuel. Maybe it is, but that angered the European Commission. And we look at Germany more closely, I'm sure uh, Dr. Heffeler may agree or disagree, but perhaps you care to comment. Um, the deindustrialization that the Deutsche Bank economists talked about has begun in Germany. That, uh, in fact, they, he believed, his name escapes me, that in 10 years' time, we're going to look back at what Germany did after the invasion, closing down factories, reducing consumption of energy, not just households, it's also factories, by closing them down to lower demand, which is always the perspective, that was, it, in 10 years' time, that will look like deindustrialization, the start of it for him. So, I guess it's time that I uh, begin to conclude. Let me say, we've only seen the start of this. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, one minute. That's it. He's very <laughs> tough, you know. He's, he's, really, he's like Ursula von der Leyen, actually. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to say that uh, we're only at the start of it. I don't know if you ever receive an email telling you not to print this, uh, you know, this email. Then they say, do you really need to email? Because, 
you know, you're going to be using energy when you, I mean, how much, I don't know. The new thing that's happening is with data centers. Data centers make a lot of heat. They uh, are very expensive to run from an energy and every point of view. And then after that, you're going to, it's already started, artificial intelligence, which as we know, is going to destroy the planet along with climate change, and probably tomorrow, you missed that one, uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence that also consumes a lot of energy. So you're going to hear, I'm a forecaster, that's what I do, right? And you may disagree with me, I can reliably say with 90% confidence that tomorrow will be Wednesday. Um, could go either way, but you know it's going to be it's going to be tough the day after tomorrow if you want to use information technology because they're going to be coming after your footprint and investigating it. And I just want to say, Tony, if you look up, if you Google, if we're allowed to Google carbon footprint calculators to calculate your own footprint, you get about a hundred thousand results. There are a hundred thousand carbon footprint calculators out there. So if you want an alternative to all of this, please read the white paper and please don't just ask questions, be critical, have a go. Out of, out of heat can come light. Thank you. Thank you James, yes. That's fantastic and do read James's report. All the leaflets have the QR code on it along with our other publications. Uh, it's the room. Thank you so much. Well, it was amazing. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Yeah. Mania. <laughs> it was a pleasure, really. Um, yes, ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to start with uh, thanking MCC for organizing this event and Professor Woodhausen for his study and his presentation. It was extremely interesting, and I mean that because um, the, the, the lack of debate is, is really a problem, not only in not only in uh, energy transition, but also in, in everything what we uh, what we see, and um, it's very necessary that it's very necessary that we have this debate on the energy transition, and and therefore I also want to thank MCC for inviting me here. My reaction has two parts. First, I will give my personal takeaways. Um, what are the most important things? I will take back to the European Parliament and also to the Netherlands. And secondly, um, there's a lot of other stuff here. Uh, and secondly, I want to add four points to the discussion that I find important. First, the points that I will remember after reading this report. The Green Movement is about energy austerity. I really find the next sentence from the report illuminating, to be illuminating. The EU actively seems to disagree with what many would assume to be the common sense goal of energy policy, producing and circulating more energy. It sometimes seems that the EU operates on the opposite assumption, that the goal of policy is to reduce energy, energy generation and energy demand. Although it's rarely articulated with this level of frankness, the fundamental logic of the green energy movement is energy austerity. Indeed, energy austerity is the ideology behind the Green Deal, a policy bundle heavily influenced by the green movement. Conservatives, myself included, are often puzzled by the green inconsistencies and ir irrationalities. We think they don't understand the consequences of their action and proposal. However, if we accept that they are actively wanting to reduce energy generation and <coughs> energy demand, it all starts to make sense. They want to produce less energy, so we have less economic growth and there are less people on Earth. Probably they see humans just as parasites on this planet. But life is energy, and energy is life. For me, this energy austerity policy is an irresponsible risk with our EU economy. 
companies will leave the EU because of the increase of energy costs and with that production costs and the loss of competitiveness and the increase of bureaucracy. For the Greens, it seems like that is exactly what they want, want to achieve. The report argues how the EU focus on envi environmentalism has distracted it from ensuring sufficient energy supply, leaving at risk of being unable to meet its energy demand. In 2019, I have written an opinion with the title From Green Deal to Blackout. And this is becoming quite realistic now. We were extremely lucky with the weather conditions last winter. But blackouts are not to be excluded anymore. After four years in the European Parliament, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I was never involved in politics. But after four years in the European Parliament, I have learned that facts don't matter. It's all about ideology. Belief in the climate crisis has become a status symbol that signals education and social class. This belief provides psychological satisfaction because it is associated with morally good. At the same time, the belief involves a strong rejection of the people who do not accept the belief in the science of man-made climate change. The problem with following the science is that the science is following the money. The number of climate scientists has grown like a wildfire the last 15 years because everyone wants to have a piece of the pie. And the climate change industry is big business. 40 to 50 trillion dollars dollars worth of capital. And that's an estimate by Goldman Sachs. Big capital and the green movement walk hand in hand with this narrative. And that's why we see most of the times only retired scientists who are no longer dependent on the system are the ones who can and dare to speak out freely. They are the ones who tell us there is no climate crisis. But with all this money involved and fear that it spreads, the belief in the climate crisis has really become so strong that it has become a religion and a real debate is no longer possible. If you want to discuss the energy transition, they call you a climate denier, a kind of witch. You don't have to burn on the pyre, but they will absolutely cancel you. That's why I appreciate the report of Pro Professor Woodhausen so much. We have to speak out. We need this debate. After all, we live in a democracy. The climate religion prescribes an anti-industrial and anti-consumption ethic. Green policies will lead to extremely high energy prices, poverty, and blackouts. We have to push back. Ladies and gentlemen, now part two of, the, of my, uh, of my uh, speech, uh, let me introduce some extra points to the conversation. Professor Woodhausen writes that the EU climate policies have shown limited progress, and that's true. And I would like to add something to that point. Even if the EU climate goals would be reached in 2050, the effect would be a decrease in the global average temperature of 0 0.04 degrees, four hundredths of a degree. All these thousands of billions of euros will have no measurable effect. Fit for 55 only cost 5,000 billion euros. It's, it's, uh, and that will have only an effect of uh, 0.004 degrees, four thousandths of a degree. To be clear, this is according to the official models of the IPCC. So climate policy is not only extremely expensive and leading to blackouts, it also has zero impact on the climate. I have commissioned my own study titled Road to Climate 
neutrality by 2015. That is a summary available. Uh, we, we put it uh, near the drinks. But um, it's peer reviewed by uh, also Professor Nordhaus, who was the, uh, the climate econom who won the Nobel Prize in 2018, and other um, IPCC uh, members of the, of the members of the IPCC. Um, it is a co-commissioner between ECR Group and the Renew Group, and this report concluded that it's practically practically impossible to generate sufficient energy with wind and solar as there is not enough available land space to cover all electricity demand. This is because of the low energy, energy density of these renewable technologies. So climate policy is not only extremely expensive, leading to blackouts with zero impact on the climate, it's literally impossible to try to reach climate objectives with wind and sun because we don't have enough land space. The study advises the EU to embark a nuclear renaissance program. My third point is energy shortage. Um, I have said it many times in the industry and energy committee and also in the plenary. In order to solve the short-term <coughs> energy shortage, we need to reopen and scale up the fossil and nuclear power plants that we have closed recently. And indeed, for the long term, we need to accelerate the construction of nuclear power plants like France did 40 years ago. And we need to speed up the research into the fourth generation nuclear energy. I was uh, surprised by the low, uh, the low amount of money. One billion euros is, is so, it's nothing. That's for everything. And we, we, we need 200 million euros for uh, molten salt reactors. We in the, only in the Netherlands, we spent 17.4 billion euros to subsidize biomass. And that's, that's burning complete forest, mm -hmm. 74 million euros. We don't have money for 200 million euros to invest in molten salt reactors. For me, it's crazy. And lastly, uh, my fourth point. Um, and that's an optimistic point. I believe that once the results of the disastrous climate policies will become clear to the voters, because the people cannot pay the bill anymore and will turn their back on the green policy, then the elites are forced to make realistic changes. You can, you can see that already in Germany. The green honeymoon in, Germ in German politics is definitely over, as voters are counting the cost of the policies on their own finances. The right, including the FDP and the CDU, is now starting to reap electrical benefits by exploiting anti-green themes. Go into full opposition. We know how important Germany in, is in the EU, so therefore I believe that while the Greens are destroying German competitiveness, their governing might be the beginning of the end of the European climate policy as we know it. In the meantime, in France, a long political debate over the future of nuclear has now been definitely set it in its favor. Last week, also, France National Assembly passed laws to formally abolish a target to reduce nuclear share of the electricity mix to 50% and formally approve the construction of at least six new reactors, nuclear reactors. France seems to have clarified what it wants from European energy and climate policy going forward. France wants techno uh, technological neutrality. This would mean a radical departure from the approach the EU has taken so far and would be my preferred option. Innovation is coming from a free market, not from Brussels bureaucrats. Let every nation choose its own energy mix. Get rid of the re renewable energy directive and its targets and create a level playing field for nuclear and renewables. Thank you very much.
Thank you, John. John, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this kind invitation. It will not be a lecture, but it will rather be some comments, some critical comments. But as you have mentioned, it's time for critical, open speech, and it's always good to not agree with all of the things. Yeah. But you're right in many things. Uh, I'm delighted to have such a young audience as well, and. I will rather focus on some comments on the, the policy machine. I think it's very important to, to understand how politics here in Europe and with the nation states function. And a lot of observations, James, you made are true not only for the energy sector. We can <coughs> name other policy fields. I think it's something which I would like to, to convey to you to better understand how mechanisms work, because only if we have understand how the narratives, the procedures, the how to gain majorities or lose majorities work, and then you have learned a lesson which you can apply to other policy fields as well, and there are many others out of energy. Well, uh, James, I start with your criticism on the energy narrative. I would like to say that uh, this whole less energy issue is not the topic we should follow. Well, I slightly disagree with this, because as an economist, of course, saving energy is in the best case saving costs and this is something which we of course have to achieve i agree that energy is the essence and the machine is run by energy but i would not give up the overall objective to be more efficient in terms of energy usage where to invest money and Siron has co correctly pointed out this is a clear case of misallocation as we say as economists the question is where to spend money and uh, i would like to leave the European space because a lot of our discussions are very much in this cage of Europe and I have lived many years abroad in Asia uh, and observed the discussions from abroad and, and also worked in the field for example of development policy and this is a clear case where we should have invested much more. We spent trillions of euro here in Europe with less efficiency, marginal efficiency had we invested, for example, this money abroad, we had covered a lot of objectives, not only in the energy efficient or the global climate change, but also in developing, for example, and getting partners to Europe. We Europeans, as being the normative project, as we always call it, have failed in this respect. And over the 10 years, last 10 years, I could observe how we lost credibility, sadly, I must say, because this was where Europe stood for, for a new dimension, a new idea of society with less consumption with those circular economy issues, which I still believe is a big issue, and which is very conservative, by the way. Uh, but we have lost our credibility because we didn't make our homework. We failed our objectives. Sadly, I must say, and others catched up. Uh, not always to our advantage, not only in the field of energy, but if you put it in a wider range of geopolitical competition, for example, energy absolutely matters. And having the more convincing ideas on the play is what matters these days. It's not just weapons, it's ideas of a new economy, a new society. And this where we have unfortunately not made up our homework and had not been so convincing as we pretended to be in the last years. Um, yes, the dependency issue. Um, you're right, we are probably getting from the rain into the eaves, uh, getting from the bad to the worse. The discussion on de-risking or even decoupling from China, which we have learned now the hard way with the Russian aggression on, uh, on Ukraine, um, should have opened up. But we are apparently indeed running again into the same and even worse dependency on critical raw materials. Um, we have not tapped into our own resources. This is something, even from an ethical point of view, a very nasty thing, I must say, because we exploit others human forces, nature, elsewhere, only to be going to bed in the evening, we have a, a clear conscience. That is not something which we can follow. And this is not ethical. And this is one of the typical examples of shortages in, in thinking um, about politics and its implication for the, the people, not only in Europe. We have to look beyond. And we always claim that, that we have a global responsibility. Yes, please, take it serious. And then it's the issue, it's not just the Congo, it's we can name thousands of issues. If we do not want to exploit others, we have to do it here. And we definitely can apply higher standards of labor rights, for example, of environmental protection. But it's not about just grabbing everything. We will run in an ethical dilemma, which is not widely discussed. And this goes, by the way, also in the migration issue. I mentioned that the structural challenges we have 
is not limited to energy. We, if you carefully think through a lot of policy approaches by the EU, you will see that they are not coherent in many ways. They assume to follow only one objective and forgetting that it has a lot of implications. Politics, unfortunately, is a, a nasty beast because it's not one objective you have to follow. It is a, a set of often contradicting objectives and this makes politics very difficult and not very clear and it's not a religious conscious it's a hard work day by day to <laughs> to combine to rebalance different objectives and you get sometimes your hands a bit dirty that's the fact uh, but where pure morality leads us we have seen it in history and we see it in these days as well you mentioned a lot of incoherences in, in European politics, but in this respect, I must sometimes defend the European policy because it's often the nation states who do not act upon. You mentioned France on one side. Germany is, uh, unfortunately, one of the biggest sinners in this respect. <laughs> Whenever we need our own interests to be solved, uh, we dismantle all the promises we have made, and this is nothing new uh, for only in times of the war, for example, look into the European energy projects 10 years ago, had we followed that promises, had we had a much more coherent policy and had not run into a lot of these troubles of interconnectivity, for example, within Europe in balancing different needs. But it is, and it was to some extent, <coughs> Germany who followed its own approach, regardless what it has uh, on negative effects on its neighbors. Surprise, surprise that we are not very much welcome any longer and we are not credible any longer and quite isolated um, in the European theater. A sad thing if it's about the central state, the largest economy and has a huge impact, of course, on the neighbors. So this is something how politics should not work and we should first blame ourselves. In this case, I speak for the German side, <laughs> not for the European one, which we have to we have consider. And this is something I hope indeed uh, changes will happen, probably not fast enough and at a tremendous cost. Uh, the first thing you learn, for example, in, in energy economics, the first hour is this famous triangle you have to follow. And this is about uh, environmental issues. It's about affordability, the price issue, and it's the, the social issue to a large extent. Uh, you can't get out of that dilemma or trilemma, as we call it. So whoever tells you we have found the solution to get rid of these nasty Incoherences sometimes uh, don't trust him because you are caught. This is a cage which you never can leave for economic and for physical reasons as well. So it's again balancing these different objectives. And this is not very sexy to a large extent. Uh, you can't sell it so see, because you have to tell people, sorry, we have to some extent get dirty hands in certain things. And only time by time and by evolution, not by revolution, we might change it. The next thing I uh, would like to comment uh, is indeed leaving the European cage. Um, we have too much focus on our own soil. We have, as I mentioned, a global responsibility and energy is a global business, not only from a physical point of view, but from an economic point of view. So we have to, to sit together with others and please don't reach out, for example, to Algeria or Morocco or to the, the Middle East. If you are in dire need of energy, then you will creeping in and begging for energy. This is not that kind of cooperation these countries want and, and need. We lose a lot of opportunities by approaching only on single issues. We have to approach to these regions on a more comprehensive um, approach and also to achieve our, uh, and to uh, leave, uh, to lift our international weight because we have lost it with this single issue, very narrow-minded approach. So politics, energy politics has to be part of a broader approach to our neighbors, for example, and then only then we are more credible in, in respect. So I'm focusing on that because focusing on single policy issues often leads you not very far and you're wondering and waking up the next day <coughs> wondering why it doesn't, didn't work, why there is no response and no acceptance on your policy because you have not understood the complexity and the needs of others as well. And if we talk about development, and energy is only one aspect that goes for our own societies as well as for others. We would like to have more of it in our boat. The, I'm a bit less, uh, James, a bit less skeptical about the deindustrialization issue because you refer to the, the German issue. That is an issue I do not 
negate, but um, I think that highly developed nations such as Germany might be able to, to restructure and to overcome. The, the bigger challenge is the other European countries who are less developed, are less capable to simply finance and fund this transition. There our shared responsibility comes again into, and that is quite clear a message that we have to have a differentiated approach that what we call in our center unity in diversity as the motto of the European Union uh, applies as well to the energy policy that we should not, uh, and I fully agree with both of you, um, prescribe how people should and societies should achieve this objective. There were different ways, even within Europe, not to talk about the, the global level. Um, let us create the space for, for innovation, let it be open, and I'm, think, I'm quite convinced that market process, to a large extent, are the better solution than creating a cage of regulations, uh, which we, and this is a comment on the outgoing commission and probably something for the new commission in 2024, that now it's time to reflect, to, uh, to implement, also to monitor and of, of course also to abandon some of the regulations. And that's why, for example, the EPP now called for a moratorium on new regulations because we have totally lost the overview and we have no idea what we created, what beast <laughs> we created. Uh, let's be more humble to some extent, focus on a very few things Europe really can do better. Among those in the energy, for, for example, is the interconnection, the integration, the finally creating a European energy market. It doesn't exist. We always proud on our single markets, but if you look into the energy market, it's a disaster because it's the, the small little fortresses around not connected. This is a lot of inefficiency we have created between Spain and France, for example, the typical example. Now we are slowly coming up. So we had overcome these problems 10, 15 years ago had we really followed the promises we made. Now it's not too late, but it's extremely costly. And it comes at a time where Europeans' position in the geopolitics has already weakened to a large extent. So create a more coherent approach, be humble, be focused on certain issues, and be open uh, to innovation. This is the only source which Europe has really at its hands there. It's still not unmatched, I would say, but it's still competitive in terms of uh, uh, the relation, for example, to, to China and, and the US. This case is not lost so far, but we have to create the space, the open-mindedness, and the freedom, indeed, of discussing different approaches. Um, we, and I would close, like to close with this, uh, as well concerned as you about the, the limitations of discussions, what Europe made great was not the, the homogeneity, the unity, a forced unity. It was this incredible competition of ideas, sometimes with wars, combined unfortunately, but in, in science and other things, this huge space of innovation and freedom that made Europe great in the last 500 years. And we are about to lose this, and others will catch up with us. So be not afraid. You are not the last generation, definitely. You have the space, hopefully, and the capacity to, to overcome and to find completely new solutions, which then makes Europe absolutely attractive. The case is not lost, but let's work upon it. Thank you. Okay, thanks ever so much, Peter, uh, for those very interesting thoughts and stirring it up a little bit. Uh, uh, as we said, we wanted debate. Now, there's lots of, uh, lots that's been said. I'm aware there's a lot of people in the audience, so I am very, very shortly going to uh, take some points from the audience, even though I would love uh, to quiz you myself. I do think it's, though, fair just to give James a, a short opportunity, mm -hmm. if, if you would like, uh, given that you've had two very substantial responses to your thoughts. Uh, is there anything you would like to pick up on before we take uh, questions? Well, thank you. Uh, I'm out of my depth compared with uh, my comrades here. Uh, I just want to say... Rob, I don't agree with the category, the energy transition, which you began with. Uh, if you look up Vaclav Smil, a Czech-Canadian energy historian, that's quite a mouthful, he has calculated that fossil fuels used to, in around 2000, uh, account for 86% of world energy demand, and now it's 82%. 
If that's a transition, it's sounding to me more like British Railways. <laughs> um, both of you said, uh, which isn't like me, um, but I, the other thing I want to take you up on, or two other things, uh, uh, um, Rob, and then go over to Peter. Uh, I'm an atheist. I was a, a Buddhist. Uh, I was a Christian. I'm now an atheist, a friendly atheist, not a Richard Dawkins kind of atheist. And I know religion is quite a big deal in Hungary, but I put it to you that uh, the climate stuff, the obsession with climate is not a religion because it wants to go backwards and it has no sense of transcendence. Transcendence, ladies and gentlemen. Something great, something beyond what we're doing at the moment. Something not necessarily feudal or uh, all of that. I know that the caves that we came out of were low carbon caves, you know? <laughs> but they were caves. That was the, that was the problem. So. Just on this very familiar comparison, I don't like to split, split hairs, uh, but it's important that we clarify that, as an atheist, I prefer religion to the green obsession. Right. Now, turning to you, Pete, uh, well, uh, sorry, one more on Robin, if I'm allowed, yeah. quickly. Um, I didn't quite follow. ...to 50%, at the same time as they want to build some nuclear, six new nuclear plants. Did I understand you rightly? Uh, they they rejected the, um, the, the, the at first the, it was that they want to restrict it to fifty percent mm. maximum of nuclear power, and they abolished that. So it's it's not the case right. anymore. And right. now they also have a new. Um, they also uh, voted for six at, at least six new nuclear. Well, I think that that's, you know, the, the latter part of that is pretty good. But what I was surprised by, and I don't want to be nasty, uh, I'm a pussycat, really. But uh, of all the countries you could have put, picked for innovation as a result of the free market, I would put France last <laughs> in that transition. Because you and I know that the French taxes and state expenditure are even worse than the, than the British saw. But we'll come back to that. Right? It was a bit of a laugh, anyway. Um, now, turning to Peter very briefly, uh, some great ge anti-German remarks there. Uh, um, but I'm a, a you know, uh, ich bin ein Berliner. So, uh, you know, I, what I'm more worried... The part of Germany. Yeah, no, I know. I, know. The, I, I hear you about, you know, economies in energy saves costs. Right? I'm all for that. I don't believe it's the task of energy to create jobs. Otherwise, why have fusion power as a project? Because fusion power is not going to generate many jobs. Right? And with luck, it could be nearly free, you know, in a way that nuclear fission hasn't really been free. Uh, I hear you, but you must know the famous English marginalist economist, uh, Stanley Jevons. J-E-V-O-N-S, the Jevons paradox, everybody. If I find that energy is cheaper for me, I'm going to use more of it. Right? And, and it's a bit more clever than that. But I don't think that energy efficiency is the solution to everything. It's limited by that. It's limited by the laws of thermodynamics. And if you want to insulate Germany's homes uh, or British homes, it's going to take you decades. If you run the numbers, you know, I, I want long-term strategy, but not for 2060, and so on. Nearly done. Um, the, uh, you may be right about German industry, but where I think you beg some questions is, I think the problem that, uh, the, uh, many of the problems I said so myself are indeed of member states not just of the EU, I buy all that, but uh, y you said that the relations that they have with, uh, say, Africa are very much closed just to energy, not part of a bigger picture, and they're done in emergencies. And Africa doesn't like that very much, and so on. I'd go further if I were you. I would say that it's great that Senegal 
um, Macky Saul, the head of Senegal, has said no nation on earth has industrialized on the basis of renewables alone. Africa is giving quite a lot of pushback in favor of fossil fuels, quite rightly. European initiatives, on the other hand, al along with every green initiative, is always to restrict fossil fuels in Africa. Because as Hillary Clinton once said, you mustn't make the mistakes we made. So when you want more partnership with Africa, let me say it's got to be on their terms. Yeah. Historically, our terms have been extremely unfair and extremely unethical and are very much about restricting uh, their growth. Okay. I'll stop there, Tony. Great. Thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Now, whilst uh, you in the audience collect uh, your questions, I've just got two questions for uh, uh, Peter and Rob. Uh, and uh, they're sort of not uh, directly specifically uh, either of you, but in general. So the, the first thing that really struck me, uh, Peter, is that you said about understanding how things work in Europe. And you can uh, create a consensus, you can lose a consensus. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that around the energy issue, people are speculating about a shift. That there is this discussion about the centre-right, uh, basically the EPP, uh, looking at how things are with energy and going, hey, this isn't too clever. And then the Social Democrats are saying, be careful, EPP, you could really mess things up. Mm. Yeah? Because actually, the only way you're going to get a, a coherent alliance is uh, if you work with us guys. And you're now beginning to look right. Now, I don't want to you know, pin you down on too many specifics, but I suppose I'm partly aiming this question at Rob here is if you take on board how things work in Europe and the need to form uh, uh, consensus and coalitions, what's your thoughts? I mean, you know, so I guess the question is, is there a shift occurring? Uh, and so I'm interested in Peter's thoughts on that. And Rob, how do you think you're going to build uh, this alliance? You know, how is it actually going to work in practice you know, to, to build an alliance to realistically change perspectives? Well, I leave this issue of religion away because <laughs> in my observation, much of politics is more religion and you understand better <laughs> you see this through the lens of theology or philosophy than rather politics. So being a back to more rational approach uh, is something we, we should, uh, and we as conservatives, Christian Democrats, are the least to be played. We know much about religious issues and we are cautious and about also this. We are not the spokesperson of the church, as some of the famous forefathers said in the early 20th century. We are Christian Democrats as politicians. And this is a different issue, so much about the limitations of uh, a religious concept. And, and sometimes science, indeed, pretends to be a kind of religion and does not know its own limitations, which are for good reason there. Mm -hmm. uh, but back to the, uh, the movements. Um, we, are concerned about the, the strangling of, as I mentioned, of innovation, of entrepreneurship. This was at our heart. Maybe we have forgotten it to some extent. We have to revitalize, re-energize again the spirit which made Europe great. Not only the large companies, but the small and medium companies where a lot of innovation potential comes from, particularly in the energy sector. It's not the big companies who are innovative. It's uh, in my home country, for example, Bavaria, if a lot of these hidden champions also in the energy sector, which are small companies, nobody knows, but they are the decisive factors in, in trans, sorry, transforming the system. Uh, I would like to unleash this potential and not strangle. And Europe has to be aware of that, and this is something which we as conservatives have really uh, to open the space. This is the small and medium enterprises, along with all these social impacts which come along in terms of middle classes, for example, uh, this is the, the concept we have to recreate, re-strengthen. That is my political message, and I hope that the party will follow along that lines in this respect. To whom to co forge coalitions is something which I say is the second question. We have to do our homework first. I'm not predicting how the elections will run and what kind of coalitions we will be able to forge afterwards. Maybe uh, Mr. you will have a different opinion on that, but this is not my main task. We have to come to terms by our own ideas and our, we have to mm. propagate this. I'm not looking to others. It's what we can sell mm. in the political market. Okay, great. Thank you. Rob. Well, um, let me start with uh, saying that 
the EU should make should make life of the people in the EU better. That is the first thing. And I, uh, what, what I said, I was never in, involved in politics before uh, I entered the European Parliament. It was a kind of coincidence. But um, I was surprised that with all these political games, um, we, I, as an entrepreneur, my, the, the most important things was my client. A long relationship with my clients. Now I'm in politics and I transform that exactly to the same. The most important things is, is the people that gave me the, the mandate to represent them. Mm -hmm. And what I see is a lot of colleagues, uh, once they are inside the politics, they, they make a career of politics. Huh? They lose the, 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 the goal that they are voted, the, the people voted for. So, as a, as a um, yeah, well, I, 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 I will not call myself a, a politician. I, call, I prefer to call myself a representative of the people. I look at the tactics, not to the strategy. And what, what I see a lot of times is it's about strategy in the parliament. And, and, and working with social democrats, working together with the Christian Democrats. Um, I'm sitting next to, uh, I'm, I'm in, let's say, at the edge of, of the ECR, and next to me starts the EPP. When I talk to these people, we are pretty, uh, we have a pretty same ideology idea of uh, how, how to serve yeah. the people. But when it comes to voting, they, they vote with the Greens, they vote with the Social Democrats, and I, I really don't understand that. Uh, but I think it will change the next mandate. We see now that uh, talkings are going on. Um, we see in the, in the ECR, uh, we have Czech Republic, we have Poland, we have uh, probably Finland, we have Italy, and we have uh, Sweden um, in the government. And, and I think, the, and I hope, that the EPP will make a center-right coalition instead of a, a center-left coalition. So uh, for the next mandate, I, I have good hope things will change. And also that, and I, I also want to um, express myself, I, I'm not again against phasing out fossil fuel, but if we yeah, I, I, I still call it the transition because that's how they call it everywhere. <laughs> but if we have to do the transition, we need nuclear power. That's the only way to go because we need a, a steady base load and we, we cannot rely on, on weather conditions. So, um, yeah. Okay, that's well, my point. That, we'll, we'll go out to the audience for questions. It's just very quickly on that, though. It is interesting to note the number of people in this discussion. Everyone gets obsessed talking about nuclear and base load, as if we, if we solve the electricity question, it's all solved. Whereas in reality, the, the majority of our energy usage is not electricity. That's true. It's you, you know, industrial that's processes require yeah, uh, a, a, a gas and coal. Yeah, I mean, it's like yeah. fossil fuels. So, so solving the electricity itself wouldn't solve the problem. So I guess it's quite interesting why everyone focuses on that. Um, and if I just may add, consider the time we need to build, if we realize the plans which are currently on the table. We're talking not about 2030. This takes 10 to 15 years to run a new reactor. So we are way in the 1940s till we have the first results if we now decide to switch a bit. So time matters to a large extent, and that's the sad thing that we rely, unfortunately, on large scale of gas um, and coal. Um, the energy density issue, which has been mentioned, is unfortunately a nasty physical fact, which is often not considered. So consider the time we need, even if we rely now more on nuclear, and the costs yeah. that are let aside. Great, okay, I, I'm quite low down, so put your hands up high. I've got Professor Bill Derodier uh, at the back there, please. Uh, yeah, and James said he was going to be very polite in his responses, so I'm going to be a bit more forthright with, with respect, I hope. Um, <laughs> I, I think, Peter, there's a modicum of complacency, in, in my opinion, in what I've heard, um, because we can all talk about efficiency, 
But you have to decide what comes first, production or efficiency. Are we producing energy that we then look to improving the efficiency of that production? Or do we design first an efficient process and then think about producing something? It, it never happens that way around. And if I may, and I think I'm right, and I'm sure Professor Woodhausen will correct me, Volkswagen are already looking to leave Germany. BASF already have, in part. Yeah? Now, I know these may not be the small and medium-sized enterprises that you're wishing to celebrate, but sometimes big is beautiful, and in terms of efficiency, often more efficient. So I do think we have to prioritize production over efficiency. And then very quickly on Rob's uh, comments, if I may, the, I mean, I hear that your critique of the Greens, and obviously there's a, there's a double entente possibly there, and you know, maybe you're talking about green ideology per se rather than the Greens, but in my opinion, I've heard this from every direction. It's the Greens, the Reds, the Blues, the Yellows. They all are dismissive of energy production and all celebrate sustainability without ever being able to actually pin down what that means. And I just want to finish very quickly where Professor Woodhausen started. <coughs> One of the problems as I see it is that we simply don't celebrate energy production. You know, this, you know, it's like energy producers are seen as a problem. And until we create a culture within which young people want to go into energy production rather than read Michel Foucault, then you know, <laughs> we will have a problem. Uh, and it's celebrating what actually made the European spirit isn't just fancy ideas and you know, twiddly music. It derived from energy. Any civilization worth its salt, you can look at energy production and then it becomes civilized, not the other way around. Okay. Thanks very much. Now, um, everybody else, you are very welcome to make uh, uh, comments. You can also ask questions. Entirely up to you. Who else would like? Yes, at the back there, please. Thank you. Energy Councillor from uh, permanent delegation of Turkey to the EU. Uh, well, I, I'm also an energy uh, PhD candidate in Groningen University. I am on the same page with you because I, energy has been, has been my uh, field of uh, expertise for the 25 years. So first thing uh, for critical raw minerals, uh, we need them, we, we, we need a mining boom. And for mining, we need energy. And 80% of, as Professor told us, 80% of energy is fossil fuel based, and it will be in 2040. And energy for, for a mining, uh, the cost of a mine, uh, depending from 30% to 70% is energy. So for, for a mining boom, we need energy. For energy, we need fossil fuels. So it's a big paradox. And secondly, uh, as for uh, nuclear energy, uh, the small modular reactors is very popular, and Europe is going that way. Uh, today, I, I learned that in an article, very informative article, there is only one single company in the world that generates fuel for small modular reactors. And it's affiliated with Rosatom. So we need a big technology, and uh, we need a, a, a big uh, shift in terms of providing generating fossil, uh, f uh, nuclear fuel for, for small modular reactors. So there is a big transition, big shift in Europe. And uh, Turkey is a candidate member, aligning her policies to the EU to become a member. But there is a big transition here. So how do you? Uh, see this, the ramifications of this big transition in foreign policy and also in terms of geopolitics for, for the EU, because it's going to be a very, uh, I'm working on, on, on my PhD dissertation, it's, it's going to be a very important uh, shift as well as this, because Africa will be very important, Latin America very important, and China is obviously uh, Thank okay, you great. Thank, Thank you very much. But I'll take one or two more. Um, we said we want ideas to be heard and not you don't have to conform to anything. So please, if you want to have a go at Professor Woodhausen here, 
Um, he'll be more than happy for you to go for it. So don't think you have to follow the spirit of what's been said already. Um, anyone like, yes, please. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for uh, the invitation. I'm Mishtan as a consultant in research and innovation as well as in cohesion policies at Technopolis Group. And uh, starting with a small remark, so only from Horizon Europe uh, between 2021 and 2022, mm -hmm. there was approximately a 5.8 billion euros dedicated to energy, so uh, research and innovation. I don't know uh, how much member states contributed to res uh, research innovation, but that's only for uh, uh, from the side of the Commission. On uh, on the other hand, because uh, um, uh, Professor Gutausen, you advocated quite much for uh, a more efficient European Union, as well as for uh, for uh, let's say as as much as I understood for overstepping or negligating member states' uh, autonomy uh, by, by, uh, by negotiating in the name of the whole union from the side of the commission uh, within, uh, within African states or, or other states that produce energy. Uh, if I understood correctly, then uh, what would you say, which institution to uh, to to terminate from the side of the EU, so uh, the Council, the Parliament, or the Commission. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, that's a that's a great question to end on. Um, well, not end the session on, but end that round on. Right, James, you can get to go first this time. Well, uh, look, I stand corrected on the Horizon program. Right, I must have missed it. Because the, the, the tsunami of regulation and intervention, also Britain doesn't like the Horizon program, or the Horizon, <laughs> pro <laughs> the, the, uh, Horizon program doesn't like Britain, and you know, in my sleeplessness, I missed it up. But you and I know, sir, that 5.8 billion sounds like a lot, it's not that different from 1 billion across 27 nation states, you know, the most that... They, uh, f uh, funded by the EU, you're right, uh, it's still peanuts, you know, compared with, say, arms, or, uh, you know, the plans for a European army and so on. But I, I hear what you say, and that's the great thing about MCC, that, you know, you can learn things. Uh, the same thing is, I want to say, um, Bill, I'm James. Can we we save time and we'll have yeah, en yeah, en energy efficiency <laughs> if we do that? Uh, what I think he was hinting at was the you know the efficiency of energy production is very important. Uh, that's different from insulating your home. You know, efficiency in energy consumption. And you, sir, from Turkey, are quite right. Nobody knows the fossil fuels that go into mining, or indeed the fossil fuels that go into putting a wind turbine in the sea, right? Uh, or putting a wind turbine in Czechoslovakia where they don't have a lot of sea, the Czech Republic, uh, I mean. <laughs> Another one you've missed. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, uh, it, it is a fact that the power density of fossil fuels is incredible that electric batteries are not going to get there very soon. They may get towards it, although you'd need a real breakthrough. In the same way I differ a little bit from, uh, uh, from Rob, that, you know, I, I, I loved your Dutch point. We don't have enough space for solar panels. Very Dutch. Uh, well, never mind. Um, I'm, I'm half Dutch, so I'm allowed to say this. But I'm sure you would agree that, like nuclear power, the, the efficiency and the clout of solar panels could increase quite a bit over the next 10 or 20 years. But it's, it's slow potatoes. It's all very slow. I've got the numbers. So uh, I think that the debate is excellent. It's a free debate. Um, and uh, just going back to, to Bill, especially with the young people here, I think he's entirely right, right? What, uh, what the Dutch always say is, what I miss, what I miss in the, all of the critiques of, you know, energy and climate policy is the romance of science. 
Would you write that down, please? No. Well, the romance of science. You know, we don't have that. We don't have a romance around energy. We don't even have a bromance around energy. We've got to get that back. And in this agree, uh, respect, I very much agree with Peter. To str we'll come back to Georgie Hegel. But, you know, weapons are important, but ideas are also very important. Ideas. And we don't have that sense of magic with which I grew up, the space race, computers. Instead, watch that email. It's already destroying the planet. Okay, great point. The reaction tells you that you had a great point on that romance, uh, romance of science. Um, think about it. Peter. Um, shortly back to this efficiency issue, I'm not uh, focusing solely on the production of energy. I go through the whole supply change and value chain, and this is the point. And you mentioned that point, for example, of the, the carbon footprint, this meters we use. Um, this is a very narrow aspect. If you really go from A to Z in the whole production process, including the mining issue, for example, then the perspectives dramatically change, Incredible. and what is green level is not green at all. Um, we have not come to that, and, and we have to work in the public uh, very much upon that kind of information we have to see about, and then the dynamics might shift in public discussion. Um, to our Turkish colleague, um, the small reactor issue is one example, but the other example is the, the carbon storage and usage issue, where we have a lot of interesting research, but, uh, but not in an industrial scale, and the energy consumption of that process is unfortunately nasty as well. So unless you have abundant energy at almost zero cent, then you can probably forget, and this will not help. Unfortunately, these issues are calculated in the IPCC uh, reports <coughs> as a massive contribution, but I have no idea whether we will be able to really calculate that into for the next 20 to 30 years, maybe then after, I don't know. But it is not something you can already take as given for the moment. This is not fair to argue that this gap remains to a large extent. And this 10 to 50% of the emissions reduction if we follow these calculations. But this is not a serious calculation because we do not have it at hand. Neither do we have the small reactors. Nice ideas, but we have shut down our capacities. And the your, uh, uh, country now started, I think there's a new center for nuclear research now set up I, in Leiden, or I, I think. That is one of the very few in Europe. In Germany, we have totally dismantled mm. our nuclear physics to a large extent. And it is tainted. Nobody tries to get into the PhD in nuclear science, for example, because you are immediately accused um, as being pro-nuclear. And this is a non-go in Europe. You are caged and better leave the country <laughs> than trying to build your career on that subject. As important as it is needed, and we had a long tradition, unfortunately, we invented the atomic, atomic nuclear physics in the early 20th century, also the atomic bomb, to some extent. <coughs> Thanks, Pete. <coughs> Excuse me, Rob. Well, uh, yes. First, <coughs> uh, Professor, uh, Professor, uh, yeah. Um, I, I agree with you that um, uh, focus on energy production. Um, before, before, uh, in the beginning of my mandate, I was at um, the, the port of Antwerp, and we had um, an interview there um, with, with the CEO of ExxonMobil. And he was, he was starting his speech with, we embrace the Paris Agreement. And it's, it's incredible, it's an oil company. And um, so afterwards I went to him and I said, why didn't you start that you are proud that you provide our Western world with uh, reliable and payable energy because it has brought us so much prosperity. Um, why? But, but there is a, the, a feeling of shame being in fossil industry, being in the nuclear industry. And it's so strange because um, what I said, energy is life and life is energy. It, it's, it has brought us maybe 150 years ago, we became 50 years and then it was over. Now we became, we will become 82 and average, uh, and that's all because of, of, of payable energy. So it's really important to, uh, to understand that. 
And um, being proud of that is also good, but that's uh, something we have to learn again, I think. Um, I hope that young people will go into uh, energy because it's uh, one of the bases of our economy, it's one of, our, of the bases of, of life. In, in places in Africa where they have energy shortage, that people will always be uh, live in poverty. We, we need to give them energy also. Um, about the mining, um, about the mining, um, I spoke in the parliament that the, the commission is always start doing things and then they start think to think about what are the consequences. <laughs> we, we discussed this, this, um, this shortage of raw materials. It's not a surprise. Everyone should be aware of that. And it's so strange that in the, Euro the, the Commission has 35,000 intelligent people working over there, and still we make that mistake. Or maybe it is not a mistake, I don't know. It's on purpose, because when once you're in there, there is no way back. But um, for, for me, yeah, it's um, um, th this, this, um, this clean energy has, has a very dark side. And it's, mining is one thing, but the waste is another thing, because uh, wind turbines at sea, uh, the, the, we have a wind turbine park at sea, um, Amelia, after eight years, the first wind turbines went down because mm -hmm. the sea is, 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 is killing this uh, everywhere. So, um, and then on the question, um, what was it? The Parliament, the Commission, or it wish to terminate? Which to terminate? Well, to gain efficiency. To gain efficiency. <laughs> well, um, I can be clear in that. Let's eliminate uh, eliminate the, the European Parliament. I want to abolish my own <laughs> job. Um, let's, yeah. do, let's do that by the people from uh, the national Parliament. Uh, make the Commission a secretariat, and, and not more than that. Not the initiative of legislation, and give. The, the initiative of legislation to the council, I think that will make it more effective and, and very more, and that's a very important thing, very more uh, democratic, because now the, the initiative of legislation um, is at the commission, and I, I really don't understand that. I cannot control them if I ask questions. I, they, they just don't answer them. Uh, I cannot send a commissioner uh, at, at home well, we as a parliament, we are not able to do that. We only can send the complete uh, commission at home. Um, it's just not a democratic institute. Okay, we heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, I'm going to push it by five minutes just because there are people who are really keen to speak. So if, you're, if you don't mind, we'll just go five minutes over and take a last round of questions. So I can see my colleague Norman Lewis. I can see this gentleman here. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a broader political question about what this, the implications of all of this is for the future. Because when I read James's report, it kind of struck me very stridently that the EU in particular, the Commission and Brussels, are really failing. And it, this is very, very severe as a very important point because <coughs> if we fail on energy, then it seems to me that what's really been brought into question is the whole notion that you know, the Brussels and the EU and the Commission, as you just correctly said, which is not accountable uh, to, to, to anybody, have really failed in the fact that they have always asserted that they as the experts, the technocrats, know what's best for the rest of us. And that they don't trust us as ordinary people. Um, which is why they're going on about disinformation, about everything that we're so stupid and gullible that we're going to believe anything that anybody says, and which is going to get votes for, for the wrong people in their, to their eyes. And so that my, my, my broad question is this, that if, as you said, James, if there is already a severe winter and the lights do start going out, you know, will this have major political consequences, not just for the existing commission, but for the concept? of the EU as a whole. Is this not really what's on the agenda? Sure. And this is the severe political point. You know, the final point is this, that the lights go out. You know, there's a saying in English that when, the, when, when, when things really get bad, the shit hits the fan. 
Well, the good news for the EU bureaucracy is that the fans are not, not going to be working. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I've got two here, yeah. Uh, you first and then you. Oh, okay, thank you. So my question would be, uh, sorry, my name is Bernadette Strum from, uh, I'm a trainee at the Parliament. And my question would be that uh, what solutions, what innovations and what energy sources do you see that it could solve the current energy crisis and the further crisis uh, in the following years? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Andrea Borghi. I'm a senior consultant with uh, Hanover Communication. And uh, the first one is very marked because, of course, as a part of the uh, big EU machines, uh, tend to smile when people tend to assert that there's no accountability in the Commission and it's their fault for not assessing the impact of what they do. As far as I know, the Commission is appointed by political uh, representation from those from MEPs on the recommendation of the state. <laughs> So in the end, our member states are not the laws. They are the one accountable. They're the one who should be accountable. And on energy in particular, uh, we're talking about the EU has many faults and is late on many things in policies. But for example, raw materials. Raw materials, the key component is foreign policy. The EU was never allowed to pursue a proper foreign policy and engage properly with its neighbors or its allies. So it's a little bit of an hypocrisy to say that their fault that they use late. We are late. We are too late. We will not manage this. The second point is, of course, the fact we're talking about energy production versus energy efficiency somehow. The main thing is the EU will never be able to sustain production for its manufacturing or for its livestock. We don't have the space. We don't have the resources. We don't have the materials. We can do some. We can do a bit more than what we do now. The only thing the EU can control and European countries can control is energy efficiency. That's the only way that you can act because that's the only way we have the power to, to regulation, to reduce to eco design, and so on and so forth. So that's why we focus on this, because the only thing we actually control that we can actually do. So there's not much space there. And then in terms of question, if I there's two points that are actually missing from the discussion that's been a little bit touched upon. It's not really, I think, the issue of energy policies as much as industrial policy. There's been a recent shift now in the kind of dialogue following the uh, US IRA. Do you think, well, my assumption is, no, of course it's not enough. We are already too slow. But this is supposed to continue with the next commission with a new change of sentiments towards you know, common ambition versus national policy. How do you see this play out in the coming uh, months and, uh, and years in particular? And then, of course, the key point is, where are the money? Because we can do everything we want, we can change the targets, we can even change it the way the EU works in terms of regulation. We don't have the money that the US and China have. We cannot okay. put them on the table, we will never do it. So how do you see that balance out, even if you want to change the policy framework? Thanks very much indeed. Right, um, I, I didn't look this way, so I'm just going to see, is there anybody who wants to make a quick question on this side? No, everyone's hot and looking forward to the cocktails. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go in the opposite order this time. Uh, Rob, are you happy if we start with you? Uh, yes, that's okay. Um, first, uh, the cold winter. What will happen if the Commission fail? Uh, yeah, normally you, you keep people uh, accountable, but that will not happen. Mm. I, I, I can predict what will happen. We need more European Union to solve the problem. That's always the case. They create every, they create a crisis, and then they said we need more European Union to solve the problem, and um, so that that's it, it will only become worse. When Russia invaded Ukraine, they say, oh, see now we have an energy problem. They blame Putin, and what Putin did was is, is terrible. There's no discussion about that, but. The energy shortage was created by the Commission itself because we um, we scaled down all the reliable and fossil and nuclear energy, which is reliable, and we replaced it. Uh, we started to replace it with uh, renewable energy, but yeah, it, it was not there. Mm -hmm. So we make ourselves dependent on. The answer was. We need to accelerate the renewable energy, which was the problem. That's why, why, when it started. 
but so that's I think what will happen. Um, then the, the the second question I missed. Um, I don't. Can, can you can you short repeat your your question? Well, yeah, my question yes. would be that uh, what uh, solutions do you see to solve this uh, current energy crisis and the further ones as well? So Are energy we? dependency and so on and so forth. I, I said it also in my speech. We need to produce more energy. I, I find it really incredible that Germany closed all uh, nuclear reactors. I think we should reopen it. I think we should reopen um, the, 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 the coal-fired power plants that we have in Europe. Um, and, and, and from there, we, um, we have stable and reliable energy. And from there, we, um, we, we start investing in, in nuclear energy. But really, for me, nuclear energy is the only way to go. And also research in, in fourth generation, for example, molten salt reactors. Um, and then I come immediately to the, the third point. Um, the, the third point was the, the energy efficiency is the only thing we can do. Well, for me, it's very strange that if, you, if there are restrictions, that, that's what I said, if I, if I have a business, I make a business case, I, I see what is possible, what is my return on investment, and what is the risk and risk analyzed or and risk assessment. And if your risk assessment says uh, energy efficiency is the only thing you can do, then it's incredible that, that, that you start um, facing down all these reliable energy sources. And, but I disagree. There's a lot of things we can do. We have to invest in, for example, molten salt reactors. Um, if we have uh, thorium as a uh, fuel, um, we have, we have um, uh, very reliable, payable, very safe form of energy. And I, I really don't understand why the EU is not investing in that. I, I asked for a budget for 1 million euros. They didn't give it to us. We are investing in renewables, burning forest, building wind turbines and, and, and solar panels. There is no innovation in that. So um, there is a lot of things we can do in a different way, but it, it's really uh, a choice of the European Commission to do not. Franz Timmermans said to me, do the numbers, do the numbers, when I ask for nuclear energy. That is how, why this report was made. Um, I have the evidence, it's not, just not possible. Nuclear is the energy, and I agree, France is not um, a, very, a, a very open market, but at least 80% of the energy is produced by um, nuclear energy. And of course, we need also some fossil fuels to, for transport. But it's a very good start. And, and, and for me, um, the way they started to, um, to do this transition is really the wrong way. OK, thank you very much, Rob. Peter. I don't want to start a constitutional discussion on the construction of Europe, because this is another topic we might we can return to. Yeah. <laughs> to that. Um, I would like to give you, you more power as the parliament. Oh. Because if it's about controlling accountability, it's the normal <laughs> process that you are the one who has the superior power. But this is another topic uh, I would not dismantle, which, but I would rather strengthen you to become a real democratic uh, control. Um, I would like to respond to the gentleman on the raw material issue and critical material issue. Um, it's not only the, the policy to be blamed in this respect. Uh, we have these discussions over a cycle of 10 to 15 years, and it's often the industry itself who says, oh, we rely on markets. The market will provide us with the mission. Not everybody who knows about political economy and energy sector raw material is a typical non-market market. Uh, knows that this doesn't work. So it is both parts to be blamed of not having systematically followed and integrated this in the wider concept of our foreign policy relations. Uh, now with the resilience issue, uh, with, it's the new type of, of framing of the policy. We are back to that extent. And I hope that we finally make up our minds that this is an integral part. The other nations, be it China, be it the US as well, had always kept that at the core of their foreign policy relations. So this is just rather the Europeans who separated that and thought business is business and politics is politics. That doesn't work, at least in these fields at all. Um, the money issue was also mentioned. Um, Europe has not a lack of money. We spent, and whether it's financed by tax or by debt is another big issue. <laughs> it's rather the latter one, the debt issue, which is maybe also 
uh, Jen and Tom, uh, John, a topic we have to discuss maybe in the NFCC because what we are currently doing is not sustainable in a real understanding. We burden on your shoulders trillions of euro in debt, and I have no idea who will ever pay that back. That is the real lack of sustainability from a more social dimension. But uh, the money issue is not the problem. Uh, we have the money. It's a political decision where to spend. And the Horizon program was also mentioned before. And it was a big debate, unfortunately, by large pressure on the German part to do not include, for example, research on nuclear. Now it's a very tiny part. It's sneaked in somehow due to the French, I think. But you see, science policy is really also shaped by ideological perceptions. Uh, so this is a very efficient tool because this has a long term strategic implications. If you shut down these, you can't revive it within short period. You need generations to regain, if at all, that knowledge. Mm. So these are instruments we have also to see, carefully look on. Thank you very much, Peter. Sorry to cut you short, because I know you, we have more to say, but um, I, I realize we're now 10 minutes over. So James, you've got two minutes. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, well, look, uh, just to say, that um, don't trust the big multinationals. On the right, with the exception of our friends here, uh, <coughs> are now having about the net zero policy. They are completely invested in it. Because they had so few independent ideas of their own, they, the one thing that they can grasp is the apocalypse. And they really believe in the apocalypse, and it's coming, it, it, it's coming soon. So be suspicious. Be curious about that. Um, somebody mentioned, I think it was Peter, that you know Germany has fa phased out um, nuclear... Uh, research and, and nuclear scientists and so on. In Britain, we didn't phase out them out; they just died. You know, <laughs> phasing out is too much work uh, for us. Um, but I want to say that you know uh, what Norman said at the back. You know, what does all this mean for the future of the EU? It's a big question, right? It's 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 going to tear it apart. Is my five-year bet? It could happen in five months, nearly. It'll be, the process will begin in five months because already the conflicts uh, are growing. You make a very fair point, sir. The EU was never allowed to have its own foreign policy, to which my reply is, thank God. <laughs> uh, um, uh, now, uh, do I get 30 seconds for that yeah, 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 extra no. time? Um, the, uh, now, uh, here's a controversial point which you may not like, but I'm delighted that we can have this debate from what you, the good part of the old left, not the Stalinist part. Uh, I've been beaten up by Stalinists, so I don't need any lessons on that. And with the right, what it shows to me is that left and right don't mean much anymore. That, uh, you know, you, you said, well, you're supposed to serve the people. It sounded a bit Maoist, but I, I can get along with that. You know? <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, you know, but a very famous Hungarian said, he capitulated to Stalin, his name is Georgi Lukács, who I'm sure the Hungarians know here, because of none. And uh, he said, you know, the prospect facing the world is class war or world war. Now, we can see some tendencies towards world war. It's called Taiwan. Right? But also, I think we have to understand that classes exist. I mean, uh, you know, no, of course we don't have them in England. Remotely, it's so old-fashioned, that concept of class, but we do. And the, the behavioral control, the mind control, the ideas control, is a form of class war nowadays. It's not about left and right. It's not about the Soviet Union. It's about the culture wars are the class war. Now, don't ignore them. They're very important. Nearly done. Um, now, what are the solutions? An excellent point made here. And ich bin viel pragmatische uh, on this. Pragmatism, just for once, although I'm an idealist. Let's do some experiments. Let's try fracking. We, won't, we don't even know 
whether we can do it or how much there is and all of that, it's got to be banned. You know, and that's a British thing, ban everything, <laughs> right? But, you know, unless you do the experiments in science, you can't move from uncertainty to a quantification of risk. So let's do some fracking. I got no problem with renewables per se. Yeah, one minute it is, Tony. Um, I'm all in favor of molten salt, although I prefer the cocktails uh, <laughs> later. And um, I think the main thing that comes out of it is that the combat of ideas is so important. And I just want to leave you with well, something that um, Heisenberg said, only the great German physicist to whom you were referring, only a few people know how little they know about science. Everybody thinks that they're a scientist. If you look at British Parliament, they're all humanities graduates who will tell you about the science. Yes. And they put it on a pedestal, uh, you know, like it's a god. There is a religious component there. They don't know anything about science. Right? And I've managed to avoid reciting the first 40 elements in the periodic table. But if you ever want to blow somebody away, You'll go hydrogen and helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, yeah. sodium, magnesium, and aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon, potassium, calcium, stannium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, germanium. <laughs> <laughs>